Welcome to the second in my Horus Heresy Legion Guides, where I'll be tackling each of the 18 Legions in their Heresy Era appearance. This time around, I'll be focusing on the third Legion, more commonly known as the Emperor's Children. Like last time, I'll be basing this conversion on the Mark VI Space Marine kit, but that's not to say that you couldn't apply some of the techniques demonstrated in this guide to other marks of armor instead. Once I'd clipped away the parts required to build the legs and torso, they were cleaned up of any sprue tabs and mold lines. My first change was to the torso piece itself. The Emperor's children strive for perfection, be it in the arts or on the battlefield. As such, their armor reflects this with many ostentatious details to make it stand out among the more utilitarian chapters. To represent this, one of the front torso halves was taken from the Blood Angel Sanguinary Guard Kit. But before they could be joined, I needed to remove the obvious Blood Angel's iconography. This particular piece featured a small droplet in the center of the chest. This was rounded out into a more generic gem shape by carefully slicing away the top of the drop. Some careful shaving was then performed to remove any excess plastic and to create a more rounded shape. With the blood drop removed, the sanguinary guard torso front now needed to be joined to the Mark VI torso's back. As this new kit doesn't separate torso pieces, it meant that the torso front of the Mark VI armor had to be sawed away from the legs. The cut was made just above the belt before being trimmed back a little further with my knife. To see where things were and weren't lining up, the remaining front and back halves of the Mark VI were dry fitted before the new torso front was compared against them. This revealed that I hadn't cut away quite as much of the Mark VI's belt as I needed. To fix, a few small cuts were made around the belt areas. Frequent comparisons to the new torso were made to ensure that the cuts were being made in the correct locations and amounts. Remember to take this process steadily it's much easier to cut away more plastic than it is to replace it. Once everything was lining up, the Mark VI parts were glued together. While I'd achieved a decent fit, it wasn't seamless, so some sprue glue was applied to the contact points. Sprue glue is basically glue which has had chopped up pieces of sprue melted into it. This created a viscous grey goop that helped to fill in a few of the gaps left behind when the pieces were pressed together. After squeezing out the glue, I left it to dry. With the glue dried, the excess was shaved back, leaving a smooth join and a finished, more ostentatious looking torso piece. When it came to the weapon, something a little more flamboyant than a regular old power or chainsaw was required. The Stormcast Vanguard Hunters carry blades that are not all that dissimilar to the Palatine blades, so it would make for a good starting point. It was a little too angular, however, so some of those harder corners were shaved and filed back. In order to attach the blade to one of the Space Marines, it first needed to be cut away, just above the hand. The same was also done to a Mark VI sword, just above the handle. Once separated, both pieces were then smooth flat at the contact points. Attaching the new sword to the hand with glue alone would have been possible, but the bond wouldn't be quite as strong. To strengthen this joint, I started by drilling a 1mm hole into both the blade and the hand. From here, some 1mm steel wire was glued into the sword before being glued into the hole in the hand, fixing the weapon into place. Finally, both the sword arm and one of the regular Mark VI pistol toting arms were glued to the torso. The winged talon is the symbol of the Emperor's children, and a motif that is often repeated across the weapons and armor of the Legion. When sourcing components with similar wing stylings, the Blood Angels kits make for some great choices. This particular shoulder pad was taken from the Death Company kit. All that needed to be done to use it on the Emperor's Children was to cut and trim back the small blood drop symbol that hung beneath. Following this, the pad was glued to the right shoulder. A primary shoulder pad was then glued to the left. This particular pad was chosen as the thickness of the trim matched that of the Death Company one. For this next modification, I took some inspiration from Fulgrim himself and looked to recreate the leather strips hanging from his belt, which are based on the singular militare worn by Roman soldiers. There are components in the Mark IV Space Marine kit that you can use here, but I personally decided to sculpt my own. These were created with green stuff, which was mixed and rolled out flat onto a Vaseline greased surface to prevent it from sticking. 
This was then left to part the cure for an hour or so to help it firm up a little. Once it had part the cured, it was then cut into a roughly one centimeter by half centimeter square. Three vertical cuts were made into the flattened green stuff, but not all the way up so that the remaining strips were still joined together. From here, the tips were then cut into points. During this whole process, my knife was coated in a thin layer of Vaseline to prevent the putty from sticking to it. Once everything had been cured, I simply wiped away any residual Vaseline with a tissue and it proved no issue for the painting. To create studs, some tiny 0.5mm ball bearings were pressed into the putty. Now while it was something that I didn't do here, I would very much recommend adding a spot of superglue to them. A few of mine ended up falling off later on. But once the studs were in place, the strips were then carefully placed beneath the belt with just a little pressure used to fix it into place. From here, the individual strips were carefully bent into positions that matched the pose of the rest of the model before being left to cure. The Emperor's children are molded in the perfect image of their Primarch Fulgrim. As such, many sport the flowing white hair of their gene father. There weren't too many heads that had the ideal hair without looking like a space wolf, so I decided to add my own hair to the shaven head of a Mark III space marine. More green stuff was cut and mixed, but this time slightly more yellow was added than blue. This helped to soften the putty, making it more pliable and therefore easier to create flowing organic shapes. Once mixed, some lumps were added to one side of the head. This was so a defined parting could be created. This putty was then smoothed down across the head to create the rough shape before scouring in with a sharp tip tool. This created the effects of strands of hair. I directed these towards the right shoulder, mimicking the direction of the belt and keeping the flow of the model all going the same way. This process was repeated on the other side of the head, but the hair was directed around the back of the head and towards the right shoulder, which completed the bulk of the hair. To add a little extra detail to the hair, some fine threads of green stuff were rolled out and gently laid on top of the hair that had already been created. These were carefully pressed down just enough to bond them to the rest of the green stuff, but not to flatten them completely. Several leads were added and laid over the shoulder pad too, just to help incorporate the hair into the rest of the model. With the hair completed, the backpack could be glued on, finishing the model, making it ready to be painted. But before we go on with the painting, let's hear a little bit about the sponsor of this video, the Paint Case 2.0 from Frontier Wargaming. I'm fortunate enough to have a dedicated hobby space in my home, but that wasn't always the case, and I had to work from the kitchen table and keep all my materials in a random selection of boxes. But the paint case from Frontier Wargaming seeks to solve this portability problem. It's handcrafted from plywood to be sturdy yet lightweight enough to be carried around. The whole thing has been designed around modularity, so you can tailor all the inserts to precisely suit your needs. There are these lidded toolboxes to hold all of your brushes, knives, clippers and any other equipment you need for hobbying, as well as paint trays that can hold up to 32 dropper style bottles or 18 citadel style paint pots. There is even a special tray for oil paints too. But it's not just a carrying case, it also doubles up as a portable workstation. The lid folds down to create a work area. There are wet pallets designed to fit neatly inside the case and you can also add on the small but powerful LED light too. So if you're on the road or you just want to clear up some clutter, then this is a great solution. Plus, if you're after that extra flair, you can even get a custom engraving done on the front. Viewers of my channel can also get two extra inserts for free by adding them to their basket when building the case and using the code PTW during checkout. So head on over to Frontier Wargaming, link in the description, to pick up one of these cases for yourself. So a big thank you to Frontier Wargaming for sponsoring this guide, and let's start some painting. The painting was started off with a primer, specifically Vallejo's Black Airbrush Primer. Now you don't need to use an airbrush to apply your primer, regular rolled rattle cam primer will do, but the black is important. It would also allow the creation of shadows in the next couple of steps. The first paint after the primer was dark purple, which like most of the paints in this guide, was taken from the Pro Acryl range. A little was added to my wet palette and a small amount of water was mixed into it. I dipped my brush into this mix, removed a little of the excess and used a light stippling effect. This is a technique that was borrowed from the prolific Richard Gray, so if you have a chance to go and check out his work, please do so. 
This method allowed me to quickly apply the paint across the entirety of the armor, and the light application meant that the recesses stayed quite dark, mimicking the effect of shadows. This process was then repeated, but with the lighter purple. This time, the application was focused more to the upper parts of the model, and the deeper recesses were kept untouched. This started to form a gradient, moving from the dark to the light. Finally, a very conservative amount of magenta was stippled onto only the most prominent points of the model. Glazes are a great way to help blend transitions and gradients together. For mine, I applied some of the shyish purple contrast paint from Games Workshop over the entirety of the armor. I applied it quite heavily. Before it had a chance to dry, I grabbed a clean brush and applied some contrast medium directly to the area. This diluted the strength of the contrast paint and allowed me to direct it away from the raised points. This helped to lighten specific areas that faced upwards and would as such be hit by more light. Once all of the armor had been covered in this way, it was left to fully dry for a couple of hours. The contrast paint had helped to blend the lightening layers of paint more smoothly, but the hard edges were still looking a little flat. These were brought out with some highlights. I started out first with some purple for the bulk of the edges followed by some magenta for the edges that sat at the upper points of the model, such as the collar, the raised arms, and the shoulder pads. Before finally adding a few small spots of pale pink to a few of the corners and the edges, leaving a much sharper result. With the armor complete, some of the overspills could then be cleaned up with some coal black. The areas that were returned to black were the leather strips, the joints in the armor, the skin, and the pipes in the backpack. These same areas, with the exception of the skin, were first highlighted with some dark neutral grey. The highlights were then steadily built up by first mixing in some pale yellow to the dark neutral grey to create a lighter grey that was then painted onto the upper edges of the black areas. Yet more pale yellow was added to the mix to create a very light grey that was used as a spot highlight, in much the same way as the pale pink from earlier. This brought me to the metallics, I began with the steel areas, which included the vents on the backpack, the blade of the sword, the plasma pistol, as well as a few of the smaller details across the armor. All of these areas were painted with some dark silver. To help create a little shading over the metal areas, I applied a liberal layer of Games Workshop's Norm Oil. Here it flowed into the recesses to create the appearance of shadows, helping to enhance the details. These details were further picked out with a fine edge highlight of silver. Continuing with the metallics, the numerous gold areas were the next to be tackled. These included the shoulder pads trim, the pommel guard, and the decorative details which were first base coated with some rich gold. Some Reichland flesh shade was then applied to the gold. This brownish pink wash is fantastic for giving gold some warmth and adding shading without dulling down its brightness. The gold was then highlighted with some bright gold. To paint the cooling vents on the plasma pistol, I opted to avoid the usual glowing colour and instead chose to paint on some copper to create a more simple metal appearance. The recesses between the copper coils were then darkened with a wash of Agrax Earthshade. In addition to the decorative gold details, there were also a couple of gems to tackle. I chose to go for a green as this would stand out well against the purple armour and yellow hue of the gold around it. These were started off with a darker base coat of black green. Some green was then used to paint the bottom left third of the gems. A thin line of bright yellow green was then painted along the outer edge of the area I painted with the green. This resulted in a dark green in the top right that got steadily brighter as you moved towards the bottom left. The gem was finished off with a couple of small dots of bold titanium white to the top right corner to create some reflection spots, finishing off the appearance of a glossy gem. The final area is the paint with the head and the hair. To paint the skin, I began by applying a few layers of thinned shadow flesh, allowing each layer to dry fully before applying the next one, something that's particularly important when you're painting over a black base coat. This was done until I was left with a good solid coat of shadow flesh. Shadow flesh was a little too dark for the complexion that I was trying to create. Some highlights of tan flesh were painted over the more prominent features, such as the cheekbones, nose, forehead, lips, and chin. In a similar way to how the earlier application of shyish purple resulted in a smoother looking blend, 
the layer of Reichlin Flesh Shade was applied over the skin. While it mainly pulls into the recesses, it still subtly adjusted the tones and helped to blend the shadow and tan flesh layers together. A final highlight of tan flesh was then applied, but this time it was used to cover a much smaller area than before, and only used to pick out the most prominent facial features. The eyes were the next step, and is something that is entirely optional. They are a bit fiddly to get right, but if you fancy taking them on, start off with a base coat of coal black over the eye. Then add just a few dots of bold titanium white to each corner of the eye. I find that adding in just a tiny amount of water will help here. You don't want it too runny though, as you want the paint to remain exactly where you apply it. Finally, a little bit of thin Volupus Pink contrast paint was used over the lips and just beneath the eyes. This gave them a more pinkish red hue and helped to add a little more variance in the skin tone. With the skin completed, work could begin on the white hair. Again, painting over a black base coat would make things a little trickier, but by first applying a darker grey, I was able to steadily build up to white. For this first step, I chose an all-over base coat of dark neutral grey. I then followed this up with a layer of bright neutral grey. Unfortunately, my camera cut off during the step and I didn't realise, so you'll have to use your imagination here. But essentially, it was layered on in much the same way as the previous base coat, except the deepest recesses weren't touched, which left me with this. And finally, some bold titanium white was used to highlight the strands, giving them the finished white hair. At this point, the model was pretty much completed, but those shoulder pads were empty of any iconography. Unfortunately, I didn't have any Emperor's Children specific decals, so I thought I'd have a go at doing some freehand instead. Bronze was chosen to create a metallic effect to the symbol. The top edge of the wing was the first to be tackled, then the first column of feathers, followed by the second. Finally, a small crescent was painted to represent the talon. The icon was looking a little flat though, so some light bronze was carefully painted along the top edge of the wing as well as along a few of the feathers. The base was the last area to be tackled, and to offset the darker colour of the armour, I used some of AK Interactive's Sandy Desert Paste. This was liberally yet carefully applied across the whole base to help create an uneven surface. Once the whole base had been coated, it was left to dry completely for a few hours. While the pristine look worked particularly well for a member of the Empress Children, he looked a little too tacked onto the base and not really engaged with the environment he'd been placed within. This was resolved with a little light dust pigment from MIG. This powder was dusted over the base and over the bottoms of the legs, paying attention to make sure all those nooks and crannies were filled in. This gave the effect that dust had been kicked up and had clung to the lower parts of the armour. Last but not least was the varnish. Everything was given a coat of Army Painter's Matte Varnish, which I applied through my airbrush. This helped to seal in the paintwork and remove some of the glossiness created by the washes. Just be aware that varnishes can tone down the dusty effect of the pigment, so if it does, just apply a little more pigment over the top. And with that, the model was complete. And here we have the completed Heresy Era Empress Children Space Marine. While I made five changes to a single model in this video, these don't need to be applied to all of your models, and can instead be spread out across a whole army. By focusing these details to just a few select models, such as unit leaders and characters, you can add a huge amount of theming to your army without having to dump a lot of time or money into it. This is the second guide of the series, where I'm tackling each of the legions in order, so if you haven't done so already, Check out my previous Dark Angels guide and expect to see a similar guide for the Iron Warriors next. For those of you looking to recreate the scheme, I'll include all the paints used in this guide in the description below, along with some affiliate links to where you can pick them up for yourself. So before I go, let me say a huge thank you to those who make these videos possible, my wonderful patrons. Currently, my top supporters on Patreon are Brush Licker Nim, Jonathan Hart, Ryan Little, Tim, Berserker, Daniel Dowling, Jake, Jesse Smith, Casper Lundborg, Morgan, Mr. Grimm, and Sweatsman. 
a big thank you to you guys. And if you also support me on Patreon through channel membership or you just use my affiliates links, then it is the kind heart of people such as yourself that allow me to fund the tools and paint required to create these videos for you. And so until next time, thanks for watching and goodbye. Thank you.